Good afternoon again, everybody, or good afternoon for the first time if you are joining us just for this debate, this session, which is entitled Equine Overtreatment, Where is the Line in the Sand? Unlike the previous uh, session, it's not two sides opposing each other, it's um, four speakers giving their uh, differing viewpoints on, on the topic. And before I get to uh, the first speaker, just want to present you with a couple of scenarios and then get you to vote via Slido. I'm not going to go through again how you do that because you all know by now. Um, and just uh, vote on what you think would be the appropriate course of action for each of these two separate scenarios. So here we go um, with the first one. Question is, would you operate on a 20-year-old pony with colic? Yes, no, or maybe. Would you operate on a 20-year-old pony with colic. It might be that you want to say, ah, oh, yes, I want to know more. Just the ball question, that's all we're giving you. Um, and let us know what you think. We're not repeating these at the end of the session, by the way. This is just to give us an idea, just to get you thinking about it. Quite tight between the no's and the maybes. I'll give you another 15 seconds or so, and then I'll declare that poll closed. Okay, let's, let's call that at 40% no, 39 maybe, and uh, I don't know how many yes it was, but on, on maths I imagine it's probably 21 because um, I did get my O level. Um, so thank you uh, for that. Quite close, very close between the, the no's and the maybes. Interested to see what you think about that, having heard the uh, debate um, in the next hour and a half or so. Second question for you to have a, a vote on is this question. Would you operate on a racehorse solely to improve performance? Yes, no, or maybe again. Would you operate on a racehorse solely to improve performance. Again, I appreciate it's a bald question, but we want to keep it simple. Well, it's pretty clear the no's are going to have it. I'll give it again another 15 seconds just to see if the figures change slightly. They are changing slightly. I'll, I'll just make sure everyone's had time. Allowing for those of you around the country who've just raced back into the room. Quick dog walk maybe in the break. Collect the kids from school. If you've done that, well done. Um, so let's call that at 73% no, 15% maybe, and 13% yes to the question, would you operate on a racehorse solely to improve performance? Right, time to introduce the first of our august panel members. Uh, we're going to start with Anthony Clements, who is a vet and managing partner at Baker McVeigh International. Anthony. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, where is the line in the sand? Um, it's uh, a very good question. Um, and so what, what I was going to talk about is what we call sports medicine, uh, which is a pretty uh, vague term, and whether we should be doing it, and, um, you know, and where, where we should stop, and... and uh, how it works. So hopefully it works. It's still about ah. six lengths clear. Workforce has moved through to head the chase. Jan Vermeer is back in third, but out in the clear. Workforce trying to run down at first sight. Jan Vermeer has three lengths to find on Workforce in third. Then Alzia behind these minus touch. Workforce has taken over from at first sight and is clear in the derby. Jan Vermeer being pressed now by rewilding for the minor honours. 
but surely they're all chasing the shadow of Workforce. About five lengths clear. He won his first classic yesterday with the Oaks. This one will complete the double for Ryan Moore. Workforce won the Investec Derby for Sir Michael Step. So, so that was Workforce winning the Derby in 2010, uh, and he still holds the record, actually. Um, so that was a pretty good day. So I consider myself quite lucky in that I work for the 1%. Some people would say I'm very unlucky. Um, but I work for effectively 1% of the owners with 1% of the horses, trying to get to 1% of the competitions. And my job is to try and help them make 1% difference. So there is only one derby. For those of you that aren't in the horse world, there's one Epsom derby a year. It's only for three-year-olds. So that's it. Take it or leave it. Um, but what does 1% mean? So 1% over a mile is 16 metres, which is about four lengths of a horse. So most trainers, if you said you can help them by four lengths, would be pretty happy. In a, in a jump off, so I do a fair bit of show jumping as well, it's about half a second. Again, most Grand Prix riders would be pretty happy with half a second. So that's what 1% is. You know, we all look at sports and athletics and everything, but and talk about marginal gains, that's marginal gains. Stood it in winning the Melbourne Cup, which is one of the biggest races in the world. You know, those are the those are the days that change your career at the end of the day. And as you can see, one percent there, full lengths. They'd have been pretty happy to take full lengths halfway through that race. So, what is sports medicine? Uh, if you look in the dictionary, sports medicine said is a field of medicine concerned with the prevention and treatment of injuries and disorders that related to participation in sports. I would say it's a little bit different. For me, it's allowing equine athletes to perform at the best of their abilities as pain-free as possible. Um, what I don't consider it to be is the ethics of sport. It's not my job to decide whether racing horses or Grand Prix show jumping is the right thing to do or not. It's my job as a vet to help the horses that are doing that. It's the, it's the social contract that we talk about that decides whether we're allowed to race horses or not. Cockfighting was legal in, the, in England until 1835. For some reason it was legal in Scotland until 1895. They took 60 more years to, to, to ban it. So, what we do now is different to what we did 50 years ago, and it's different to what we will do in another 50 years' time. So, as I say, it's not, it's not my job, as far as I'm concerned, to decide whether racing is right or wrong. It's my job to help horses. Who sets the rules? As I say, I don't think it's the vet's job to set the rules, but it is the vet's job to stick to the rules. Um, we'll go on to a little bit about racing and, and jumping in a sec, but I still, you know, still think that the UK has some of the highest standards, welfare standards of racing anywhere in the world. Uh, it has zero tolerance on race day, which in my mind is, is essential. And racing is a lot more proactive than some of the other disciplines about safeguarding that and the welfare of the horses. The reason being twofold. Number one, when things go wrong, horses die. Simple. And secondly, there's a lot of money involved and a lot of gambling. Professional sport hurts, you know. If you, go, if you join the army, somewhere between 18 and, sorry, 12 and 18 percent of, of recruits get overuse injuries. In the last Football World Cup, 54 percent of the players in the, in the Soccer World Cup played on medication, mainly non steroidals, some other analgesics as well. And they take an average of 0.72 medications per player per match. So if you want to compete in high level sport, it hurts. And if you want to do it relatively pain free, you're going to need help. Trainers' job so is to find the best athletes out there, but they can't all be athletes, so you've also got to know when to stop. You can't make something slow, something quickly. What's normal in high-level sport? So around about, in, in, a, in a big survey of Olympic athletes, 56% of them get injured, and by injury meaning at least a month out of training. Most of those injuries are in field sports, gymnastics, track athletics, etc., which is kind of what we do with our horses at the end of the day. It's field sports. It's not shooting. Um, and of those, 20% retire from sport due to injury. 
That's all good, but you know, where is our line? What's, what's acceptable? What's, what should we be doing with these horses? For those of you that are in equine, you'll see there's a horse there with a joint chip. There's papers out there of you know, what, what you can and can't get away with. Should you take them out? Should you do surgery, this, that, and the other? If you stop that horse, you've just lost the French derby. So that's the reality of what we're in. So where is that line? How do we work out that line? And that's obviously what we're going to talk about today. And some of it's experience. So these are some of the ones I got wrong. You know, this horse, I injected his fetlock, uh, and he did a condyle. Thankfully, I screwed it back together, uh, did a reasonable job, and he went back to winning in group one. But it's, I've made mistakes. I'm not professing to say that I get it all right. And it's, it's not easy. The line shifts, you know, what none of us want is this. You know, this is, in almost all circumstances, a, a dead horse. That's what nobody wants. But the line is moving, you know, a lot of the racing jurisdictions change as they go on. So the BHA, I was involved in the veterinary committee for a number of years, and these are some of the rules that they've brought in or are, or are considering. So they've made, they've made progress. I'm just not sure how much time I've got, so I'm trying to keep it going. Hong Kong, which we're very lucky to have Chris Riggs here today. So Hong Kong have made huge improvements over the last 20 odd years um, in terms of what they do, you know, what's acceptable, um, you know, that you've got to have stand downs on, on shock waves or um, you've got to image horses at least every other, other time between medications, that type of thing. For those that follow racing, California's had an enormous problem a couple of years ago. Um, primarily actually weather-induced, but they had a, a huge surge of breakdowns. And when I say breakdowns, I mean horses with uh, proximal sesamoid bones in half, uh, because those are more the injuries they get there. So they had to put in a lot of very strict rules. So 30 day stand down from intra-articular medication of a fetlock, um, 30 day stand down, down from shockwave. But they still allow you to give butte the day before, which could be part of their problem, but that's another, another story. And they're putting a lot of work into the use of PET scans, trying to predict these injuries. But these horses are actually very hard to predict. Um, Tim Parkin, uh, who's a contemporary of mine at university that some of you will know, and he studies a lot of this, a lot of, done, a lot of work in Hong Kong. These are, quite, these are actually quite rare events. And a, and a rare event becomes hard to predict. So Racing Victoria have done a... Um, a very stringent protocol. They had a, a big upsurge in horses breaking down during the Melbourne Cup, hugely public events. Um, so they ended up putting in, oh, I've got two minutes, um, a very, very strict protocol to get there. FEI, again, they have a slightly different take on things. Some of that is because at the end of the day in FEI, if things go wrong, it's unlikely that the horse is going to die. They may go sore and they cannot comp carry on competing, but you don't have a very public breakdown. So, and again, you know, we want to know what one what one percent is, and what a, you know, why we do it. This is why we do it. This is the last one in case I get vaporized by red light. So this is Ben Mayer winning the Global Champions Tour a few years back. And as some of you will know, this horse went on to do quite well. So the sound wasn't quite as quite up there, but um, so we're, again, where is the line? That's what we're going to talk about. That's kind of where my line's at, um, but it's not, you know, it's not always easy to get. And anyway, we'll talk about that later. I'm being beeped off. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, um, Anthony, for for that. As ever, keep the questions uh, coming in. Uh, if you're with us online via Slido, we've had several already, thank you very much. Keep them coming. If you want to address it to a particular member of the panel, uh, feel free to say that, and I'll, I'll go with that. And when we get to the end of the four presentations, we have a chance to contribute from the floor as well. Our next contributor is Bruce Bladen, who is RCVS specialist in equine surgery and clinical director at the Donington Grove Veterinary Group. Let's wish him a warm welcome. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, 
to address the, the, the question of equine over-treatment, and particularly in surgery, are there, what surgical procedures are necessary and, 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 and which of them are ethical? Thinking particularly of, of, of sport and racing, I, I, I've, I've selected two examples that I'd just like to present and, and, and sort of try and uh, look at the, the, the pros and cons of these. Here, here's the, the, the first one. This is a four-year-old uh, mare, female, female horse. It raced, and it finished the, the race lame. And I hope that you can all see that this horse has got a, a, a medial condylar fracture um, spiraling up into the diaphysis of the bone. So, so it's coming proximally up, up here into the main part of the, 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 the cannon bone. These fractures are notorious. They, 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 they're very unstable, and they can become complete and therefore almost invariably fatal uh, very easily if the horse is startled or jumped or, or twists awkwardly. This horse undergoes surgery. It's done in the standing um, sedated horse. So, so this is an example of, of how we can do this under, under sedation and local anesthesia, that uh, this doesn't need to have a, have a, have a general anesthetic, this horse. We would drill a glide hole, um, that's a, a hole slightly larger than the screw, down to the, the, the fracture plane. This is monitored by, by x-rays intraoperatively. We just take an x-ray and see precisely where the, 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 the drill has got to. Then drill a pilot hole through the far cortex. Um, just a, this is sort of basic lag screw technique, an engineering uh, technique. And place the screw. We always do this with power instrumentation, try and minimize the time that we have metal sticking out of the horse's leg. That's obviously the stage when things can go wrong. Tighten the screws, and, and we shift the horse's weight off the limb uh, while we're doing this. This is the technique of standing fracture repair, which is, is, is fairly well recognized and, and widely used um, nowadays. That is the finished article, uh, the, the, the repaired fracture. You can still see the fracture line proximally um, above this. Very much our goal with doing these is, is to restore the joint surface. The, 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 the main part of the bone will heal in due course, and they're very unpredictable, the fracture lines. This radiograph is three months later, um, so the fracture line has become more obvious. And you can just see how much comminution there is with that, that proximal propagation. The fracture line is just bouncing backwards and forwards up the cannon bone. If you try and put screws in there, you're probably going to put a screw into a fracture plane and, and force it apart. That horse raced again 327 days after the original surgery. So was this surgery necessary? And I, and I think we can answer with certainty. The answer is no. That surgery was not necessary. There is a documented success rate with conservative management of medial condylar fractures. This is the Sir Frederick Hobday Memorial Lecture that David Ellis gave uh, in Newmarket many years ago. This would be 30-odd 30, 30 years ago. Um, but you see, he, he was uh, showing 65% uh, of conservatively managed cases uh, racing again. Was it ethical then? Was it the right thing uh, to do? And, and in my opinion, absolutely, no question. The first thing is that these horses gain significant relief from the increased stability. Once they've got those screws in, these horses are much more comfortable immediately after surgery. This is a surgery where, during my career, there's been huge evolution um, of this technique. We began doing lag screws under general anesthesia with a very high incidence of breakdown and, and, and fatal complications in anesthetic recovery. We moved to putting plates on these, these, these bones, and now standing surgery is really the, 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 the standard of care um, for these without, without a, a general anesthetic. There is still an incidence of fatal comminution in the post-operative period. Uh, our results, three out of 40, 7.5% um, of medial condylar fractures. But if we go back in time, when this was originally described as a complication by Dean Richardson, 1984, 42% um, of, of cases were, were suffering this problem in anesthetic recovery. And even in, with conservative management, David Ellis's paper was 13% of them. Perhaps what you can question ethically is to say this is a racing injury, that you will not see this injury in a horse in the field that is kicked or anything like that. This, this happens to race horses. And all we've achieved by operating here is that maybe we've returned the, or enabled this horse to return to racing quicker and, and more rapidly than it would have done otherwise. So what about this case? This is a seven-year-old gilding. 
and it is sent into our practice for cautery of the soft palate. We scope the horse, um, and that shows a grade 2.1 recurrent laryngeal neuropathy. neuropathy. That is essentially normal. Uh, there is intermittent asymmetric movements of the arytenoid cartilages, you can see here, but full abduction is achieved and maintained. And so this horse duly does undergo cautery of the soft palate. Again, this can be done standing under local anesthesia. The purpose of this procedure is to, to induce fibrosis and to try and stiffen and the soft palate and reduce the tendency of dorsal displacement into the airway. So, so a performance um, enhancing or, or, or trying to prevent the performance limiting condition. It looks horrific, but these horses are always surprisingly comfortable. This horse eats normally that evening. As long as you don't burn the tongue, they, say, they seem to be really quite content. It has a normal temperature, and it's discharged the following morning. Now, was this necessary? And the first and most important thing to say is that I don't know. My job is not to train racehorses. I am not riding these horses. And, and it is certainly possible that the trainer uh, or the jockey are more familiar with this condition than I am and did recognize that the, the subtle signs this horse did have dorsal displacement of the soft palate. We can look at this horse's record. You see that after the surgery, it, there's, there's the surgery there, it races again um, uh, uh, 23 days after, after this original surgery, and it finishes third out of six, um, then fifth of fifth, then fifth of eight. And if we look at its rating, over here, it was rated up to 83 before surgery, and its rating is going down as well. So it doesn't appear to have been effective. And then this note appears in our clinical history. Another vet has been to examine it. And they found that uh, mild shortening in front, uh, bilateral with mild right forelimb lameness, some discomfort at the origin of the suspensory, appears to be a degree of proximal suspensory desmitis, would benefit from a period of rest. Advised three months rest would be ideal. Well, you see it got 66 days off, which is, 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 is better than nothing, I suppose. And it does seem to work. Look at this. Uh, it comes fifth of tenth, but then it wins, and then third of ten. And you see how its rating has gone up, that uh, this is a measure of how many pounds the horse might be able to carry, pounds of weight, to finish equal with another horse. Suddenly, it's got a rating up to, uh, to 110. So maybe the rest alone uh, was what did the problem. Was it ethical? It looks barbaric. There is evidence that supports this procedure, relatively tenuous, but the, the, we did show some improvement in performance index. More importantly, should we have done more to diagnose the condition? We did offer further diagnostics, um, but these were declined. We have experience of insisting on better diagnostics in these cases, and I can tell you it is very unpopular, and it results in clients seeking the procedure elsewhere. So the final point I'd like to make to you is the uh, relevance of the commercial side of surgery to, to, um, to, to um, welfare. The experience gained in fracture repair on racehorses is what enables veterinary hospitals to stock this expensive orthopedic equipment. And that experience is then transferred to, to other horses, non-race horses. You can see this pony has shattered its cannon bone. Um, but we have both the kit and, and the experience that we can go ahead and double plate that. That was a successful repair. There isn't a practice in the UK or indeed in the world that would be able to do that that doesn't have extensive experience of racing fractures. And indeed, it can be used for non-horses. This little alpaca with the same problem, um, fractured cannon bone, that again successfully double plated. And, and perhaps we should think of maybe the profits from wind surgery that, that you know, maybe it's necessary, maybe it's not. Um, but that, again, enables hospitals to be fully staffed. So, so look at this. This is midnight, okay? And see the number of people that we're able to call on. This is, this is, this is a foaling. Um, and you can see how we've got somebody here. Is, somebody's preparing this horse in case it goes to Caesar. Uh, somebody's trying to do the foaling. We've got anaesthetists down here dealing, dealing, dealing with this side of it. There's, there's, there's a lot of people involved in providing genuine 24-hour care here. And you can see, if you, if you look in here, this foal has been tubed. Um, oh, God, it's, it's round here somewhere. If you keep your eyes out, you might see it again. But somebody's already got, got an airway tube into that horse and is breathing for it. That's a specialist in medicine. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, bodies here, and these people aren't going to want to do this for free, and they aren't going to want to do it every night. So there has to be a rotor of them, and so you have to have enough people to be able to do it. 
Of course, it's a success story. I'm not going to show you um, a, a, a failure. Here, here, here is um, the, the successful case. But it's one of you know that if you're going to have successes like this, uh, commitment, surgical commitment to equine welfare, that is expensive. And, and it is, is difficult. It requires a lot of people. It's not the same as sending one person out in a car and, and then presiding over the horse dying um, so relatively slowly. It takes, takes commitment and, and profit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our third speaker on this topic is making her way to the stage. It's Sarah Freeman, who is Professor of Veterinary Surgery at the University of Nottingham. Sarah, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me to, to speak um, on one of my favourite topics, which is colic. Um, I'm just going to give this as an introductory slide about why the discussion about overtreatment and colic is so important. So this is just some data from two of our PhD students, um, Layla and Adele. Um, if you're a horse owner, the chances are if you have an emergency, you will be looking at a colic decision. And the work that we've done also showed that a fifth of the cases of colic will involve a critical decision. And that means a discussion with the owner about whether euthanasia or whether referral for intensive medical or intensive surgical treatment isn't required. So about 20% of those cases, there will be a discussion about do we want to take treatment to the next level. But when we actually start looking at the data, when those critical decisions are, uh, discussions are held, around 70% of those cases are euthanized. And so one of the questions I want to ask today is actually whether those decisions are right. Because if we think about 70%, I tried to look for a horse in the sand, and then I drew a line at 70%, and then I decapitated the horse. So essentially, we are euthanizing a very large number of these cases, and I think we need to question whether those are always the right decisions. So just to give you a little bit more detail, this is for, we actually had two studies that showed very similar stuff. Um, this is the, what happened at the time that the horses were seen at the primary assessment out in the field. So these are horses that are critical. They have a life-threatening condition that will need additional treatment. And the majority of those, 63% of those are euthanized. We have a small proportion that are going for surgical treatment, a small proportion of medical treatment. And we've got a further breakdown in the papers of how many of those survive and how many of those don't. So they are really difficult decisions. They're difficult decisions for the owner and difficult decisions for the vet. And how do we make those decisions? So the first thing we want to do is we want to look at the evidence. So we've got some evidence, um, and this is some data. We, we have a, a vet champion scheme that we run through the British Horse Society, and we send out newsletters, and this is one of our newsletters. If you're an equine practice and you're not on our, our scheme, please let me know or the BHS know. It's completely free, and we'll share these resources. This shows, shows the summaries from six different studies looking at outcome. And this is designed to go out to horse owners and also to vets. So they know the facts, they know the information. Um, and there's some data around that. But actually what I'm interested in, let's move away from the evidence-based stuff and go back to some of the things we talked about this morning. And that is the human factors. And that's what Katie Lightfoot, our most recent PhD student, was looking at. Actually what influences those decisions. Because we can have the evidence and we can be all about the animal's welfare, but actually what the owner wants and they think and what they can manage becomes incredibly important. So this is quite complicated and don't worry too much. Uh, we haven't published this yet. It will come out soon. Um, and I'm going to give you some quotes from some of these. But it's just to show that that decision is incredibly complex. For the owner, this came out from interviews from owners and from vets. There is a conflict between head and heart. Your head is telling you what the stats is, what you can afford, and your heart is telling you something different. You add on to that practicalities. Can you actually transport that horse? Can you do box dress for three months after surgery? A whole load of different factors. And then another thing that becomes incredibly important, if somebody has been through that experience, what happened to them in that experience then influences the, set, the decisions they make for subsequent horses. So if they have been through a bad experience of colic, then they are not going to want to do that, even if their next horse has a fantastic experience. And, you know, we can't ignore these things. The human factors become incredibly important. We've been talking about whether things happen and what's in the horse's best welfare, but actually what the owner can do and manage and the care that they can cope with really impacts the horse's welfare. So human factors become incredibly important. So Katie did a, a, a number of studies, interviews with vets, interviews with owners, behavior change studies, and also we did a myth-busting survey where we gave people information, for example, the fact that 
If your horse um, has colic surgery, the prognosis for an older horse is exactly the same as a younger horse. Would that influence what you did? But actually, these were the things that came up. Somebody's relationship with the horse over and over again, that's going to influence the decisions they make. We can't take that away. The vet's advice, the vet is hugely influential. What they perceive as the prognosis, the level of pain, these are very emotional cases. The level of pain can just destroy anybody's decision making. Seeing your horse thrashing around just pushes you into decisions that can be really difficult. What they think the quality of life is going to be, what they think of recurrence, and we can, so we can share some of those stats, but they're difficult. The age of the horse, I've said the data is that actually they can do very well. Um, I've operated on one that was 30 years old that came in with 15 owners, had a fantastic prognosis and did really well. But there's also data that says they can do well with the right cases. And then previous ex experiences of colic just keeps overriding. Um, what's happened to somebody in the past will influence what they do and how they feel in the future. And I'm just going to share some of the quotes from some of Katie's data. So we did some surveys. So survey participant 1,301. Katie did a lot of work for me. Um, but it just shows the level of emotion. So, you know, we, we should be advocating for the horse, but the level of emotion people have is just going to be huge, and that's going to influence the care they can give at the time and afterwards as well. And we can't overestimate how much that impacts things. Opinion of others. So we should be having a dialogue with the owner, but actually there are a number of things that will influence these. The first quote is from a veterinary surgeon in the interview, and I think that's really common. I've definitely seen it. There will be a more knowledgeable person in the yard, more knowledgeable in italics, um, that has an opinion about whether this horse is going to come through or not, and that may override your opinion. So everybody's got an opinion on the yard, and they're going to offer those opinions. And then there is also the pressure from social media. Some people feel pushed into things. If they decide not to go ahead with treatment, they feel judged. And we can't remove that. That is there all of the time. And owners may be very reluctant to talk about these things. These are difficult conversations for, for us to open up and to, to try and raise. But we need to be really aware of those things. Insurance. So insurance should help with some of the practicality. If your horse is insured, you've probably got the finances that makes the incisions, the decisions really, really easy. But I think this is a really interesting quote from an owner about how insurance puts you on a conveyor belt. It puts you down a line of you're going to have all the diagnostics, you're going to have all the treatment, you are on that conveyor belt. And that view from this, this owner in the interview about I don't want to be on a conveyor belt. I want to have that choice and that decision. So insurance has its advantages, but we also need to be aware of we don't want to put people on that conveyor belt if they don't want to be on it. And then, like I said, the pra practicalities, there are certain parts in, in England. It's probably much more prevalent when you talk to our, some, some of our colleagues in the States. They have huge distances to cover. So those things can just override. If you don't have transport, if you can't get there in time, then that actually compromises the horse's welfare, and that overrides all of our evidence-based stuff and all of our nice studies of what percentage of this type of colic are going to survive. So where's the line in the sand? Um, um, the, the, um, the RCVS, you know, we've all done the constant endeavour to the health and the welfare of the animals, and yes, that's absolutely paramount. But my point today is actually the human factors become so important. And if that owner is unable to care for that horse afterwards, if that owner is not committed to that care, if they can't do that, then actually sometimes that has such a major impact on health and welfare, welfare it becomes incredibly important. And where is the line in the sand? I believe that some of the cases that we take for surgery are so influenced by the owner, they are so emotionally involved, that sometimes the head and the heart is not making the right decision. Um, so there is definitely some cases where we have over-treatment. But I also believe that there are cases where we have under-treatment. Is that 70% euthanasia right? Are there people who are influenced by social media? Are there people who are influenced by their previous experience? And that means that they are not electing for treatment in horses that possibly could be treated very easily. So I believe that there is both over-treatment and under-treatment. And I believe that human factors are incredibly important and something that we really need to consider. And that what, that's what makes it the art of veterinary surgery rather than just the science. And I'm going to finish because Nick has red-lighted me, but he hasn't flashed at me. So that's a very good point to stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. No flashing here, um, if we can possibly uh, avoid it. Uh, Gemma has made her way to the, the stage. Don't forget, um, keep your questions coming. Lots of interesting questions already, uh, mostly anonymous, but that's fine. 
uh, online. Think about how you might contribute from the floor, any comments you might want to add, especially if it's going to provoke a, a comment from the panel, um, so much the better. Uh, so our final speaker of the afternoon, uh, Gemma Pearson, is a certified clinical animal behaviourist and director of equine behaviour at the Horse Trust. No pressure, last one of the afternoon. Make it good, Gemma. Thank you very much. So I took a little bit of a gamble having not seen the slides of most of the presenters. But I figured that when we're talking about the line in the sand, the way we would measure whether we were successful or not, whether we we're making the right decisions, would be things like survival to discharge after colic surgery, after a certain number of years afterwards, the complication rates that we see, return to the previous or higher level of competition, or particularly for racing, the number of starts, or the career earnings, or earnings per number of starts. But I think we're missing something here. Because whether a horse jumps clear around badminton or not, this was actually Bramham Horse Trials, doesn't tell you very much about the journey that that took from one fence to another. So what else should we be considering in these scenarios? And I'm going to suggest that that is how the horse is feeling. How do we know how the horse is feeling? Well, why don't we just ask them? And you might say, well, that's crazy. Horses can't speak. And obviously, we can't ask them directly. We also can't, we're never going to know exactly what an animal is feeling. But we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. So what do we know about how an animal's feeling? Well, we could start off by giving them a choice and seeing what they prefer. So several years ago, Rolke was a very controversial topic. And people were looking at the effect on the musculoskeletal system and other aspects to debate whether it was right or not. But this was a really nice study. And what they did was they rode horses into this Y maze. And for half the horses, when they went left, they were ridden in the hyperflexion, the rolker position. When they went right, they were ridden in a normal head and neck position. Obviously, the other half of the horses, it was the other way around. They repeat this so the horse knows whether it goes left or right, what head and neck position it's going to be ridden in. First thing they found was just looking at the horse's behavior, they saw significantly increased behavioral indicators that these horses were unhappy when they were on the rolker side. So things like tail swishing and attempts to buck. And then they let the horses decide. They took them down the center and they let them decide whether to go left or right. And perhaps under, um, understandably, the vast majority of horses chose to go on the side where they were ridden in a normal head and neck position. This was another research project. They looked at whether horses wanted, when they went into a maze scenario, want to go back to their stable with food or out into the paddock. Again, unsurprisingly, the majority of horses chose to go out into the paddock. But then we start to say, well, OK, how much do they value different resources? How hard will they work for them? So this was the same group. And they trained these horses to press a lever. You'll see just as the horse puts his nose here. And the horse had to press this lever until the door was released. And then they could go, depending on which door it was, into a different area. Now, what they found was when horses were going into a large paddock by themselves, they would press it an average of 38 times before they'd stop. But when they knew it was going to give them access to a smaller paddock, but with another horse, they would press it more than double the amount of times. So that helps to indicate what is important to that individual animal. We can then think about cognitive bias testing. Is the horse optimistic or are they pessimistic? This is going to give us a better indication as to the animal's whole quality of life. The way we'd look at this is we'd train horses that when a bucket is placed on the green location, it contains feed. When it's placed in the red location, it contains unpalatable feed or nothing. And very quickly, when the horses are released from point X, if it's in the green location, they know there's going to be feed in it, they go to it nice and quickly. If it's in the red location, they might wander across slowly, or perhaps not even at all. What we then do is we put buckets in the middle, and we see how quickly horses will walk to those buckets. Now, if you're an optimistic horse, even when it's in the orange position, you are thinking to yourself, ha, there's a chance that there's going to be feed in there. I might as well go and see. If you're a pessimistic horse, you think, oh, it's probably not going to be anything. It's probably not worth going to. So they actually showed this. They took horses which were trained using two different methods. And you can see the, the bottom line, the light gray line, 
Even in the ambiguous negative locations, these horses approach faster than did the dark grey line. So we can show that different training methods or different things we do with them affect how the horse feels about life in general. And then finally, I wanted to talk about qualitative behaviour assessment, because I think this is probably going to be one of the most useful tools to determine how a horse feels in a, a period of time. It's a whole animal evaluation of the expressive qualities of the animal's body language. We're interested in not just what behaviour an animal performs, but how it performs that behaviour. And it's been shown to be a sensitive measure of the emotional state and to correlate nicely with both behavioural and physiological indicators. So how do we do this? We train assessors and then we show them some video footage. And for each video footage, they have several emotional states. I've shown you just four here, such as anxious. And they are asked to score this horse from the minimum to the maximum possibilities. Now, those individual states are not important. We don't look at anxiety for any particular scenario. What we do is we combine all of this in a very clever statistical method. This starts to give us an indication as to how a horse might be feeling. I'm sure there are many people in this room that are already aware that this has been used quite successfully in the farm animal sector. So one of my colleague, colleagues, Francois, who developed this technology, collaborated with Weight Rose, um, and they determined the farm app that determines a happy animal. And this won the BBC's Farming for the Future category at the Food and Farming Awards. Um, and I'm just going to finish off by showing that I actually use this in one of my PhD chapters. So I wanted to see whether we could use classical counter-conditioning, that's a behaviour modification technique, to reduce the stress response of horses to a nerve block, whereby we're localising pain by the application of local anaesthetic. And the reason this was important to me was because lameness investigation and treatment accounts for more injuries to veterinarians than any other procedure. And there's a particularly increased risk to the vet of sustaining a fracture, concussion, head injuries, hospitalisation. So what we did was we took horses and they were randomly assigned to either the control group or the treatment group, which was the classical counter-conditioning. And that was only undertaken during the preparation phase, so when we scrubbed the limb in preparation for the injection. Once the horses were actually given the nerve block, it was completely the same between both groups. So the vet, it was the vet that was performing the nerve block it was up to them whether they put a twitch on, held a leg up, gave the horse feed, whatever they wanted to do. And we filmed it, and then we got blinded observers to use QBA to analyse how the horses were feeling during receiving that injection. So, the control group is in green, the treatment group is in red, um, and I've sl we're really looking at kind of effective state in horses, but I'm just going to call it stress for the purpose of this talk. So we found that in a multivariable model, the horses in the treatment group were scored as less stressed than those in the control group. But what was really interesting for me was the fact that in the control group, so this is on the right-hand side, the green ones, lower <coughs> numbers are generally better. When the horse received up to four nerve blocks, there was no difference in how those horses were feeling. And yet when these horses were in the treatment group, the more nerve blocks they received, the more happier and relaxed, the less stressed they were scored as. So where is the line in the sand? I don't know. But maybe we need to start to consider it from the horse's perspective. And maybe we need to start to think about tools like QBA. If we want to have a social license to operate with horses, to use them in sport, we need to think about how these horses feel. Maybe we can look at QBA and look at firing of soft pallets. You know, does it make any difference to how the horse is feeling? We can look at it for horses when they're running. Is there any difference between, you know, when they're show jumping, the happier horses versus the unhappier ones? Does it relate to how frequently we're having to medicate their joints? And I really think this is the way we need to start to move forward with this. Thank you very much. Thank you to all four of our panellists for what uh, I'm sure you'll agree was uh, a very stimulating uh, 40 minutes. And thank you to all of them for being spectacularly good at uh, speaking for 10 minutes. 
um, makes uh, my job much easier. Um, here in the hall, please do um, come forward with uh, questions. Make yourselves known to um, the roving mic operatives um, who are around and, and poised. And we've got lots of questions uh, from the online audience as well. I'm going to start with them while those of you on the floor pluck up courage to speak up and uh, say something uh, enlightening or just ask a question. Uh, this one uh, to start with is uh, very straightforward. Um, and the panelists may have different views on this. How do you know the horse is content stroke happy post surgery? Is this based on science or your own opinion? Bruce Bladen. Uh, that's, that's a fairly easy one to answer. There's been quite a lot of development this, with this, with pain scoring in, in, in recent years. And, and certainly we use, we use that routinely in, 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 in post-operative cases. Um, now, that's come in in, in in the last few years. But, it, but it, it, it's relatively simple parameters of does the horse eat? Um, does it interact with you as you go around the stables? Will it, will it, will it, will it come to the door and, and, and you know, see, see who, who's arrived? Um, and, and then there's, there's been a lot of work on the horse's um, pain face in recent years. Is, 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 is do they have tension in the muscles over the eye? Do they, do they sit there with their, their ears back? And, 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 um, and these, these are all used to, to try and monitor um, what, is, what is obviously a very difficult thing to monitor, is what is the, 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 the post-operative pain being experienced? Gemma, you've obviously done quite a lot of work in this sphere. Anything to add? Yeah, so I, I agree, first of all, with what you said so far. I think there's some really good pain scales out there now, and it's great to see that you're using them. Um, I think a lot more practices need to use them. But I think we can start to take this even further. I think we can start to use tools like QBA, for example, which might be an, be an even more sensitive indicator. And I also think we need to think about not just is the horse in pain or not, or is the horse stressed or not, but also are there any indicators of positive emotional states in these horses? You know, do these horses look differently to a horse that's come in for its routine dental for the day? And if there are differences, what can we do to help these horses be happier when they're in the box? Anthony, do you think that you could do... I'm assuming that you broadly agree with what Bruce said. Is, is, is there even more that you could do to make sure that the horse is, in quotes, happy with the surgery that's taken place? Um, I'm not sure if there's a great deal more you can do. I mean... Of course, most surgeries will have an element of pain in them. That's, you know, inevitable. Um, and obviously the question is, is that pain worth it for, depending on what you're trying to achieve from the surgery? Um, it sounds very cliche, but there is a certain element of subjective assessment and looking at the horse, and which obviously people are trying to make more objective, but that facial expression and is the horse interested in you, does it have his ears pricked, all those basic things which old school horsemen have used for years actually make sense. You know, happy horses look different to sad, painful horses. So I don't think there's a great deal more that can be done, though, other than using the scales that you know, these guys develop and using them properly. Thank you. Um, no one's being brave enough to speak up on the floor just yet. I'm ever hopeful that somebody will. Um, question from our online audience. Does the end always justify the means? And should this include the whole rehab plan or just the acute treatment phase? Sarah. I was actually going to add that to the last question because I think what the horse goes through in the short term is also has to be balanced against the long term. So if it goes through a procedure that's incredibly painful for a short period of time, but it has a very good prognosis, then probably we would be comfortable with that. But then you have to balance that for a procedure that maybe isn't very painful, but actually long term, that horse will never have a good prognosis and will always be permanently lame. So that there's some really difficult decisions around that, which means I've probably just dodged the question. Um, but, but what we're interested in looking at at the moment is shared decision making. So all of the people that are involved in caring for that horse and that can look at that horse's quality of life in the short term and the long term have a voice um, to look at that balance of short term versus long term. Thank you. It is, it is a really interesting question. If anybody wants to contribute to that question on the floor, um, do raise your hand. Um, Bruce, what would you say about that? Does the end always justify the means? I think that's, that's the easiest question in, in the world to answer, that no, the end does not always justify the means, but 
The question we're here to debate is where is the line in the sand? That's the difficult part. No, absolutely, you know, you don't keep a horse and, a, you know, anaesthetized for days or something to try, try and get it through some, some, you know, basically fatal condition. Yeah, there are, you know, absolutely, there is, there is the, the end does not always justify the means. But where is the, the, the line? It should justify the means, but as Bruce says, it doesn't always. Do you feel uncomfortable about that? Um, when it doesn't work out, of course you do. I mean, our job as vets is to help animals. That's that's the and do no harm. That's the that's our basic opera, you know, default position. So nobody wants to put a horse through colic surgery that then ends up having a second colic surgery and then ends up being euthanized. You know, that's a bad day out for everybody. Um, so nobody wants to go into those positions and expose yourself to those positions willingly, but. We don't have crystal balls. Everybody thinks we walk around with x-ray eyes and crystal balls and we can tell owners exactly what's going to happen to their horses, but we can't. We can only go on statistics and science and best judgment. But the end should justify the means, but we can't always guarantee that that's going to be the case. So there are, I take your point about the, the end result, but the, you're saying there are occasions where you feel uncomfortable about whether you have crossed the line in, in the sand, but for whatever reason, you, you go ahead? Um, well, you don't know you've crossed the line in the sand until afterwards. It's only with hindsight that you can turn around and say, actually, we shouldn't have done whatever it was we did. Now, I put an example up of a horse there that I injected 20 years ago in Cape Town, injected the fetlock, and the horse broke down in a race, and that was a bad day out, and I learned from it, and I stick my hands up and say I made a mistake, hmm. and I, I've learned from it, and touch wood, I haven't done it again. Uh, knowingly. Um, the world I work in, as I say, these events, they're rare events. And the slides I was showing, which I had to rush through a little bit, but the, the Sorry. <laughs> what everyone's trying to get through, get to in, in particularly racing, is to try and stop these fatal breakdowns. Nobody wants to see a horse die on, in public, of course not. But they're rare events and they're not easy to predict. There's a lot of people trying to help predict them and the easiest way to stop it is to say don't race them but then you're not going to win many races. Gemma do you, do you feel that you only know if you've crossed the line in the sand by the end result? Uh, yeah I actually think that's a really important point you're just making there because I've done it lots of times in lots of different scenarios you know I've done what at the time I thought was in the best interest of the horse and it subsequently turned out that it wasn't the horse had a poor outcome but, you know, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know that. And I also think there's the other aspect of if we don't try, we never progress. So, you know, I work in the field of equine behaviour. It's quite a new field, relatively speaking. And I have got cases which a couple of years ago I might just have said, look, actually, I think the best thing is to euthanise these horses. And now we're trying some different treatment protocols. We're trying some different drugs. Um, but a reasonable number of those will still end up euthanizing at some point. But you get the ones that you don't, and they're the ones that you learn from and that you improve. Exactly what Bruce was saying in terms of repairing mm. condyles. You know, you've kind of got to make those mistakes to, to move forward for the long-term benefit of the horse. Contribution from the floor, David. Uh, yeah, uh, ben, um, ben, I'm so sorry. General equine practitioner, we've done it to each other. I was going to say, that's one all. <laughs> Private joke, sorry. So, so there's um, um, interesting examples. The yeah, example of colic surgery, um, and the animal is very uncomfortable, and is comfortable after the surgery. That's the outcome that is normally the case, and that's what we desire. Bruce used the example of the condylar fracture, and pointed out the animal is much more comfortable after the surgery. But then the other example we've given is the, um, the, uh, the, the soft pallet firing, where it's quite clear for us that we feel the outcome is very dubious. And, and as equine practitioners, there are those that we can list the procedures that we, as guardians of welfare, know aren't particularly effective, but are encouraged to do for profit-making purposes or by, by the perception or, uh, of trainers and old-school horse people, as Anthony would call them. But there are procedures that we shouldn't be doing as vets. And, and as guardians of welfare, we should be listing those procedures and banning them whether that's soft pellet firing, whether that's tendon firing, and every other thing that, 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 that we, our colleagues, perhaps us ourselves, still do. So we are in that position where we can start to decide um, without crystal balls what we should, we should be done. Thank you. 
can't see those goalposts move as things move forward, but there is a list we can start to draw up, and it is our job to do so. Thank you. Ben, anyone who wants to respond briefly to that? I do want to get to lo there's a load of other questions. Go on, Sarah. I, I think that assumes that our evidence is good enough, and that's the problem we have in, in veterinary medicine, is that is there a clear cut yes or no? You know, we talk about colic stats, but there are clinical cases that don't follow, that do better than they should have done, and ones that do worse than they should have done. The early colic data, for example, we developed a predictor. We could predict which horses were possibly going to die and possibly weren't. But if we released that, that had an 80% accuracy. 20% of horses that would have survived would have been euthanized. So we have to be so careful about what we do, and we have to be really sure that the evidence is good. And, and they've, they've done some consensus statements around soft palate treatment, but, but still, it's, it's really difficult to say, this definitely never works, doesn't work, we shouldn't be doing it, because... Soft, soft, palate, soft palate treatment is, is to enhance performance. It is not for the welfare of the animal. Soft palate treatment is to enhance performance. They do it for people who snore. That's where the call tree came from. So <laughs> if you snore, is, is that a welfare... welfare <laughs> they, they also used to fire human tendons as well. Jesse Owens won the Olympics. But the question at the beginning about colic surgery that, that, that was asked by, by, by the chair was a 20 year old single colic surgery. Now, most of us who work in equine practice think that's a perfectly good thing to do, and, and, and I think hopefully most of the people in the audience afterwards would think it is. The third colic surgery in a 28 year old, that's the question that should be. Okay, let's let's move. Did you want to, Amanda, did you want to contribute to this debate or a different question? Yeah, I think it follows on a little bit. Okay. Um, because, um, sorry, Paul Mullen, um, UCD. Um, we uh, interviewed and spoke to a number of um, vets uh, involved in treating racehorses. And certainly one of the concerns they did have was wind dogs and so joint injections as well. But thinking specifically about wind dogs, what do you think would be the um, consequences of prohibiting those horses from racing in the UK, let's say unilaterally at this time, on the racing industry in the short term and in the long term? So, some of the, well, what would be the outcome if you banned wind ops? Um, you would end up outsourcing the problem because those horses would travel to somewhere else. So, in... Somewhere else, as in abroad, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, you wouldn't stop those horses racing. And you also you increase wastage. You know, that's one of the things we said. If you don't enhance these horses' performance, if you have a, a badly performing racehorse, where does it go? How many people are going to take those horses on? What is their welfare? We have a massive problem with unwanted horses, broken horses. You might say, for their welfare, we shouldn't treat them. Who wants a three-year-old, broken, nutty thoroughbred? You know, that, that's going to end up in one of the rescue charities abandoned somewhere. Is it more ethical to treat that and keep that in work and give it a useful life? Anthony, if you are just driving treatment abroad, that isn't necessarily a reason, is it, for, for not doing it if you think it's not the right thing for the welfare of the horse? So, sorry, just repeat that. If you, if, you, if you think that not performing a form of treatment would just drive that treatment abroad, as you were suggesting... That's not a reason, potentially, for not doing the treatment if, if well, you think the treatment is not the right treatment for the welfare of the horse. Uh, you know, at the moment, we're just saying wind ops. So there's lots of different wind ops. As an example, uh, I had a horse uh, last week that we know for sure. We, we last scoped her last year in October, and she was fine. She made a noise the other day, uh, was scoped, had an epiglottic entrapment, was overgrounded to prove that it was just an epiglottic entrapment. So if we're going to turn around and say we're not going to do wind ops, then that horse that could be treated with a standing surgery with a laser and is back in the yard the following day, by your definition, would have been lost to racing and chucked out. So I would say that would be a poor outcome. As I say, it's not for us as vets to decide whether racing horses is ethically correct or not. That is, a, that is a job for society. Yeah, we're a part of that debate, and I work in racing and, you know, as well as other equine sports. But it's not me to say whether that particular wind op is good, and if Bruce does a, you know, a soft pallet firing, whether he should use a laser or a thermal cautery or whatever. That is a discussion that should be had, a bit like gene editing, by a wider society. Because 
If we're going to turn around and say, well, you can't do wind ops and you can't inject joints in horses, then sure, you might as well stop racing or, or, you do the comp or you're actually going to compromise the welfare of the horses. These horses are sore. Be under no illusion that being a professional athlete hurts. And if you want to win the Derby or win the Global Champions Tour or the Melbourne Cup, it will hurt. A bit like winning the London Marathon. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. And then you can say, well, sport shouldn't really exist because we can't let people hurt themselves and we shouldn't let young kids train as gymnasts at the age of six, seven and eight and screw their bodies up for the rest of their lives. You know, or I should have been told when I was at school that playing proper rugby was going to give me a bad neck for the rest of my life. But that's what we do. So my point is that the debate on racing particularly, and racing is the most emotive because it has the most public breakdowns, which I totally get, and that's what everyone is working to try and stop, which is extremely difficult. Okay. The only way to stop it is to stop racing. Okay, that, that's, there's lots of questions that that raises, but there's a load of questions being sent in. There's a, another one, I'll come to that one next on, on the floor, but I just want to ask this one that's been sent in online. I'm going to start with you, Sarah, on this, if I may. Do the panel feel that vets are intrinsically biased towards prioritising physical health over overall welfare? Sarah. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's For me, it's all tied up together. Welfare is physical and, and mental well-being of the horse. So I think we are much, much better. I think we've got a long way to go. Gemma probably wants to talk on this, but, but I think we're much better at recognising that overall welfare and the physical health is, is one component of, a, of that. Gemma? Yeah, I think we're making massive steps in the right direction with this. I think traditionally they were, and this is one of the arguments about racehorses. You know, they'd say they have the best care, but a lot of these horses were standing in a stable without access to other horses, without turnout, you know, which is very stressful for these animals. Now, you know, some of the research we've got ongoing at the minute, we know that a lot of racehorses are getting increased turnout now. We're really starting to think about the whole animal's life um, and how they feel about it rather than just their physical health. Thank you. Question from the floor at the back. Um, Mary Rivera from British Horse Racing. Um, I just had a question about chronic pain. I think it's probably given the panel easy to turn this on to Anthony about chronic pain and, um, uh, and lameness in yards, but I think in equine practice we see a lot of chronic pain in overweight laminitic ponies in particular, which to me is an enormous welfare issue. Where do the panel stand on what position we should be taking with either owners or trainers or both, about the ethics of chronic pain and chronic lameness? I'm quite glad you asked this question because it feels like we got a little bit focused on racing, but actually the general horse population, we have lots of horses that are lame and then we administer analgesics and we try and keep them going. Where I am on it, so I'm over 50 years old, I go running and I'm lame, but I want to keep running. Um, and that's kind of what I feel, and I feel that's better for my well-being, and that's where I feel I am with these horses. So I think trying to keep animals going, recognising pain, trying to find ways of managing them, uh, is really, really important. I think we need to improve how we recognise pain, we need to improve the analgesia, but I don't think anybody would argue that actually stopping doing exercise is, is good for a lot of these animals. The more we know about orthopaedic disease, and I'm not saying we should be exercising an acute laminitic, but if you've got an obese um, horse with EMS, then actually exercise is part of the programme. So I think we have to accept that there's a whole range of things that we need to do around managing pain and keeping animals mobile that are really important. Yeah, so I'm just going to come in on that as well. I think chronic pain is a massive issue for horses, and the drugs we have available are tiny compared to what there is in small animal and even more so in humans. But I think we, I agree with Sarah, we need to keep these horses moving, we need to keep animals doing something. I actually have more of an issue with horses which are kept a little bit more like pets and just kept in small paddocks. They may be obese, they may get laminitis, but you know, if they're just going in a small paddock by themselves, that is no real quality of life. So I see riding and training horses. We know, you know that you have um, little dopamine spikes when horses are trained well. It can be enjoyable for them. So I actually think it's a form of environmental enrichment. And you know, it's really hard. You do not want horses racing on lots of non-steroidals. Sorry, we keep going back to racing. But any high-level sport on lots of non-steroidals because it increases the risk of injury. But actually, I used to vet a lot of endurance competitions. And I wish for the non-competitive riders they were allowed to do that on a low level of view. Because I think more horses would have kept on competing, the same as you know, people may take 
some ibuprofen or something afterwards to keep themselves going and would be fitter and healthier and happier as a consequence. Question online. Since when does a horse want to compete in sports, which kind of relates to what you were saying, Anthony, about professional sport hurts, but the difference with a human is that the human is himself or herself deciding whether to compete. The horse is not. In an ideal world, that would be the case, but I suspect if you asked a few East Germans a few years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. So, you know, we, we look yeah, at we it thought that, that was way, a terrible for idea. the purpose of today, but yes, you know, um, if you want to win at the highest level, everything has to be right. And you are not going to win at the highest level with horses that are not happy and healthy and sound. Full stop. Yes, you can win at lower levels, with, but that's no different to, say, you know, to saying taking your pony with laminitis to a gymkhana. You know, where did, where, you know, this is the point of our debate, where is that line in the sand? But if you want to, which most people do, want, ultimately, everybody would like to win the derby or Royal Ascot or whatever. And if you want to win at the highest level, everything has to be right. So there's no point in trying to, and racing, and as I said in my talk, you know, the, the, the standard in racing is zero tolerance. There are no medications on race day or whatsoever. And that's not the case in all, all areas, all, all countries and all mm. areas. So those horses are getting there in good shape. And as I say, to get to the top level, they've got to be happy and healthy. Bruce Bladen. I, I was going to completely agree with that. And so, you know, that, that do we know that a horse wants to do it? I mean, obviously we don't. But if you look at horses in, in fields, they'll naturally race each other. They'll, 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 they'll gallop around the, 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 the field sort of, you know, against each other. They will jump over things. Maybe it's just to get to the other side. Maybe it's for pure fun. Um, you know, they, they do do these things. And if you want to try and, 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 and force a horse to, to compete against its will, you are going to be unsuccessful. And there are horses that don't want to do this, and they become what we know as wastage. And you know, uh, um, yeah, just coming in from a behaviour perspective... Horses often do have some choice. So what's the horse like when you're tacking them up? Are they stood happy to be tacked up or are they putting their ears back, trying to bite, switching their tail? Horses that have been very happy in the job they're doing and get pain, I sometimes get called out because they can't catch them in the field because they associate with discomfort. So if we look at the horses, we'll get some indication as to whether these horses are happy with the job they're doing or not. Here's a question I think goes to Sarah first. Have you ever felt guilty about deciding to euthanise a horse rather than continuing treatment? Um, I think that the, the welfare, if an animal is euthanised, then there isn't a welfare issue for that animal. I think there is more of a problem, in, in my opinion, of continuing treatment for an animal that has a poor prognosis. Um, I've, I've had some really, really difficult decisions where I've felt... You know, the differences of opinions with owners and with other vets and things like that. And I think that's the nature of some of these decisions are incredibly difficult. But no, if a, if a horse is euthanized, then actually it doesn't suffer. Uh, just while it's the Sarah Freeman show, just for an, another one, another questioner who wants to drill down a bit more into your line about surviving for 12 months post surgery. The question is surely more important is its welfare during recovery? given the horse doesn't have a concept of pain today for gain tomorrow? Yeah, I think that's more important for the owners, um, some of the owners. And there's, there's only one study that actually has got the long-term. Most of them have the short-term survival, so there's only the, the Liverpool studies that really give us some good long-term data. But actually, the biggest influence, that's for the owners. If, if that horse comes through sur surgery, survives surgery, but has repeated bouts of recurrent colic over the next 6 or 12 months and the owner euthanases um, that... Then, then that was almost certainly the wrong decision. Um, so I think that, and, and some of the owners that we've worked with in our programme have been incredibly traumatised by the experiences. There's, there's one owner who is a fantastic supporter of everything we've done, but they lost their horse for colic and they still can't bring themselves to buy another a horse or own another horse because of the emotional impact it had on them and that they can't go through that again. So to me, that's more about sharing what's going to happen and, and what, what's, you know, the, the long-term consequences. Bruce? That, that goes to, you know, the horse has no, no question, no, no concept of pain today for, for gain tomorrow. But that goes to the whole, whole issue of veterinary treatment. You know, vaccinating is painful. 
and we, we do it because there's a benefit for tomorrow, and, and we make that decision that that is, that is a good thing for a horse to go through. And, and I think exactly the same thing goes with some of these surgical procedures. Horses with colic can be in absolute agony, and you can operate on them, and they are not in agony. They wake up the next day, obviously with pain from the incision, but in nothing like the, the, the pain they were, and, and they, they're, they're home in a week, and they, and they absolutely fly. They, they are, they are normal um, for the rest of their, their, their natural lives and don't suffer again. Not every case, obviously, but a significant proportion of them. So that, is, that is, brings us exactly back to where we were. This is the line that we have to work out where it is. But, but yeah, you know, we have to make that decision for the animal. That there is a time when we say, you are going to have some pain for gain tomorrow. So give, me, a, give me an a, indication, sorry, as a, as a complete layman, how do, you, where, how do you define the line of the sand in the kind of instance you're talking about? Um, to me, you know, sort of something like a vaccination is completely justified, the pain of a needle for the, for the, for the benefit of being immune to the disease. And for me, um, colic surgery in, in, a, in an aged animal that has a reasonable prognosis is totally justified. So what's a reasonable prognosis? Um, a reasonable prognosis is probably 60, 50, 60 percent chance of, of, of survival to, a, to a, you know, without anticipating long-term complications. Does that percentage sound about right to everybody else on the panel? Yes, Bruce, Bruce knows his stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doubting you. Know, in, in an older horse, I would say you should have a slightly higher percentage outcome. Would be, I would be nearer 75 percent unless you're at that stage and I would, I would be higher than that. Okay. Um, just looking around the room to see if anyone else is poking their head above the seat. Uh, nobody is. Uh, so, sorry, there is. Let's go to the floor first, and I've got another, well, lots of questions <coughs> online, sir. So. Nick Perkins here. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Please do. <laughs> so, are we in danger sometimes of doing things, uh, procedures, um, to uh, play to public perception rather than considering the welfare of the horse. So <clears throat> one of the panel members suggested that we could be doing wind ops and things <clears throat> uh, so as to keep horses racing rather than have wastage because wastage is uh, not popular. Um, but Euthanasia is not a, uh, a welfare issue. There may be all sorts of other problems with it, um, but it's not a welfare issue for the horse. So, yeah, my question really is, are we doing things that don't necessarily aid the welfare of the horse because of public perception, because we don't want to have the difficult arguments that come with that? Thank you for the question. Who would like to respond first? Was that aimed at me? <laughs> yeah, I think the problem with the wind op is, is what difference does it make? You know, is the evidence good enough to say it doesn't work? Because the first studies by O'Hearn actually said 80% success rate. So if it makes a 5% difference, if it makes a 10% difference, and there's five or 10 horses that actually don't become unwanted, what is the welfare? I'm trying to look at the long term. What's the welfare impact of, of, of that? You know, th those are the, the difficult decisions we make. What happens to this horse? I want to think about what happens in the short term and what happens in, in the long term um, for those, those horses. I, I, you know, I don't go around randomly euthanizing horses, um, and I try and use evidence-based medicine wherever I can, but the evidence-based medicine is flawed, and there is the individual horses that just buck the trend. You know, the evidence says this horse should not survive, and it's the most fantastic success story. Um, that, that's where I have the, the problem. So I, I'm not doing it for, for public perception, um, because nobody knows what I do. Um, <laughs> but I, I, uh, it, it's just not black and white. I think that's my, that's my problem. My no, but mo most horses don't have wind ops because there is a welfare need for them to have wind ops. They have wind ops to try and run faster to perform better. So they have the welfare issue of going through the pain of the operation simply to perform better, but we want them to perform better to keep them in training, to keep them uh, running so that we don't have uh, the difficulty of facing 
we have all this, this wastage to deal with, and what do we do with it? But if you ban, if you ban wind ops, do you ban you know, all of the laryngeal paralysis data um, surgeries? Do you, ban, do you ban every single wind op? And, and some of those horses will improve. Okay, so I, want to, I want to move on. A couple of quick questions, a quick, quick comment, Anthony, and then Bruce. <laughs> I just, I think there's a, there's a difference between performance enhancing and allowing a horse to perform at the best of their abilities. So there are certain conditions in horses that we can help with surgically, which are limiting the horse's performance. Enhancing performance or performance improvement is a different ball game. And you know, that's getting into a different sphere. Yes, you, you know, so I think we've got to be careful using those words because they tend to suggest that we're trying to make these horses run faster than they can. There are things that do that, and those are prohibited at all times and should remain prohibited at all times. But allowing a horse to run to the best of its abilities, I think is fair, and I don't have an issue, I don't have a welfare issue, I have a welfare issue with not treating them, because at the end of the day, they're gonna run anyway. So allowing them to breathe oxygen and allowing them to be as pain-free as possible, to me, is my job as a vet. Leaving the horse in pain and not able to get oxygen, to me, sounds a bit harsh. There we go. Bruce? I, I think it's far more likely we'll end up not using valid procedures because of public opinion rather than public perception, rather than the other way around. But, you know, it will seem a simple thing to say wind ops are performance enhancing, we'll, we'll just ban the lot. And we will let, be left with horses which will be suffering, which could have undergone simple surgical procedures that would have, would have, um, would have, would have corrected that. I think it's the other way around is the, is the issue. Thank you. Uh, it's a question uh, sent in via Slido from Polly Taylor. I think it's aimed at you, Anthony. Surely the vet should not abdicate responsibility for what treatments are undertaken. Shouldn't the profession be leading the way in ethical decisions? You said, we don't make the rules, we just operate within the rules. Uh, that's not quite what I meant. What I meant was, so we don't, it is legal to race horses in the United Kingdom today. So. That's considered it's illegal to have a cockfight or a bear baiting session as today in the United Kingdom. So I don't make the rule whether it's legal to race or not. It is legal to race. I don't make the rules that, set, that are set by the BHA. I got involved in veterinary politics because, as I was told, when they changed the rules and I thought they weren't done as well as perhaps could have been, it was, well, get involved or shut up. So I got involved. And I like to help, I've done a little bit, and done a bit through Beaver and through the BHA, I did six years. And um, I like to help think, I've helped a little bit and improved some of the communications with the FEI, the BHA, and et cetera. So what I'm not saying, you know, what I'm, of course vets should be involved in helping with the rules. We're not abdicating responsibility at all. What I'm saying is, it is there is a social contract that allows us to race horses in this country, both on the flat and over jumps. How long that social contract will last, how long it will last for show jumping, for polo, for endurance, for whatever, I don't know. It will change. 100 years ago, 200 years ago, cockfighting, bear baiting, and match racing horses three times a day were legal. So Gemma? the world changes, nothing stays the same. Yeah, I, I would agree with that point. And I'm actually just going to go back a little bit to something that was said before, where we said that euthanasia is not a welfare issue. Now. Obviously, it's not. But we also need to remember that if we say, OK, well, we race horses, and then rather than trying to rehome them and such like, we just euthanize them, we are then removing the possibility of a positive life from a large number of horses. So yes, for that individual, euthanasia, you, know, you then have no welfare, so there's no negative. But you're also removing the possibility of a positive as well. So, I think we need to think a little bit more carefully about, about some of these issues. Okay, thank you. Um, still lots of questions. We're running a little bit low on time. Um, despite our advice, asks an anonymous contributor, with all species, it's ultimately the decision of the owner to go to surgery. To what extent do you think vets should have the final say? Sarah. Um, I, 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 
Um, like I said, this, this, what we're working on at the moment is the shared decision-making model. So it, it should be a shared contract between the owner and the vet. We kind of think we can make the best decision, but my, my point earlier was that actually if the owner can't provide the aftercare, then they're not on board, that's going to affect the animal's welfare. I know we can't always do it, and I've had things where I'm diametrically opposed to the owner, and, I've, and, and those have become incredibly difficult. I think in an ideal world, we all sit down and we have a nice conversation and we end up with a, a mutual decision. And I think Colic's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly emotional. At when I worked at the Royal Vet College, we would take the owners out of the room away from the horse because they couldn't make that decision when the horse was, was there. Comment from the floor and then Bruce. Uh, this is in connection with this, but also the previous comment from Polly Taylor. I think, yes, certainly the vets, we ought to be the ones who are making the ethical decision on things. But often in real life, that's very difficult because, um, particularly in the racing world, where uh, there is huge pressure, commercial pressure, on vets to do certain things. <laughs> Thank you. Bruce? I, almost exactly what I wanted to say. And with the, the one thing I was then going, going to go back to the previous question and, and, and say that um, vets should certainly be involved in deciding what the rules are, but they should be in, involved through the political process. They should, they should be you know, making representations through, through professional bodies and such like. The idea of a vet working as an individual policeman and sort of saying, no, this isn't appropriate, that is just going to lead to conflict with other practices and, and, and owners being dissatisfied. I, I don't see a future in that. Thank you. Ben, on the floor. Just very briefly, uh, particularly uh, one of the concerning things for me that came out of um, Sarah's talk was the 70% euthanasia for colleagues. And that's the, that's the thing that many of my colleagues find most distressing when we know these animals are going to have good outcomes in by far the majority of cases. And the owners are convinced that euthanasia is the right way. And that, that can be a lack of education, social media influences and everything. And in, in my experiences, particularly also working abroad in, in Europe, our attitude to euthanasia in the UK is a little bit trigger happy amongst our also in the public um, for all sorts of complex social reasons, getting a new one being one of them. And I, th I think that's why euthanasia debate should be revisited um, for those positive. Gemma? Yeah, I think we just need to be a little bit careful with that because as vets we can look at the horse's perspective and what chance the horse has of a, a successful outcome but we don't know the whole story and I agree, I would take owners off at 2 o'clock in the morning when the horse is you know, just arrived at the hospital and we'd go sit in a different room and we'd talk about chances but I'd also talk to them about their financial situation because most horses are insured for three or £5,000 we quote 8000 for colic surgery now if you have a horse that comes in that's uninsured and you've got someone that maybe this horse has a high sentimental value, um, you know, and you say to them, look, it's potentially like that and that, I don't care, I don't care what it costs, I've, I've just got to keep this horse. And I've sat them down and almost made them ring their other half or a good friend and say, look, you just need to really think about this because I've seen these scenarios whereby that, like, I've got to do everything for the horse because that's my moral responsibility and they try and put it on credit cards. And I've seen people get themselves into a lot of trouble that way. So we need to look at the whole picture, not just the horse's point of view, but also the owner's. Thank you. Um, very last, very, go on, uh, gentlemen on the, on the floor, have we, can, we, can we run round? Don't fall over, don't run too fast. <laughs> Sir. Thank you, uh, James Russell, British Vet Association. Just interested to go back to the comment you were just making there about legislation for regulation of um, you know, things that Effectively, it felt like you were, you were driving in the direction of a sort of positive list of things that we might do. It, have I understood that right? Because that, that would feel like quite a challenging position for us to end up as, as, as professionals. You know, if our regulator sort of set a, uh, you know, a kind of welfare cap, if you like, on what we might, what we might do, or have I misunderstood the point? No, I, I, th I think you, you misunderstood. I mean, very much my, my goal with saying that is, is, is you know, the... the there is a role of, of, of the vet in what procedures should we do, what procedures shouldn't we do. But that should not be an, an, an individual vet saying, no, we shouldn't do colic surgery. You know, that should be um, you know, sort, of, sort of veterinary surgeons via um, Beaver be representing to the BHA or, or you know, if, you know, what, you know, should we be doing Windops? Is this, is this good? And, and, and then over, looking, you know, 
it can be looked at in the round. It's not just um, vets involved. There's the, there's the commercial side of it. There's the, the, the wastage side. There's the you know excessive euthanasia side. So no, I certainly wouldn't be wouldn't be sort of suggesting no that you know our professional bodies should just say no 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 yes no you know for procedures. Quite the opposite. I'm believing we should you know vets should perhaps be represented um, on more national bodies, you know, and, and which I believe we are. You know, okay. But that's, that's how I would be looking at it. Okay, thank you. We're, the clock has pretty much beaten us. I'm going to ask each of you to uh, sum up for a minute or so. I'll, I'll start with Bruce when I get to that. Has anybody got a, the other three of you, got a brief pithy comment you want to make in response to the last point? If not, that's fine. No, that's okay. fine. Okay, um, just in a 45 seconds or so, if you could each sum up what you'd like us all to take away from the last hour and a half, Bruce. I, I think the critical thing um, as, as welfare and surgery is, is our progress, that the, the welfare gets better as, as, as we progress. It requires um, knowledge and it requires, requires research in, into, into what is working and what isn't. Thank you. Remembering the, the issue is where is the line in the sand? Anthony? Um, uh, there is a line in the sand. Um, it's not universally set um, and it's shifting, uh, which doesn't make it easy. But we all have to strive to reach the line, that line in the sand to the best of our abilities, our profession's abilities, and to help the public as well. So it's difficult, it's very difficult, and we all get put under pressure to, to, to try and tell people exactly where that line is, but it's, it's, yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, as we can see from this debate, we, we can't actually answer it. Um, I try and find it to the best of my abilities with resources and not go over it because for me the consequences are pretty pretty bad. So I have to live with it when I get it wrong. So I do my best. Thank you. Gemma? If we want to maintain our social licence to operate and have horses in sport, we do need to think about where the line in the sand is. But rather than just looking at the outcomes of success or survival, we need to start looking at horse base measures. How does that individual horse feel about what is happening to it? Thank you very much. Sarah Freeman. Um, so the issue about where the treatment is incredibly complex, it's about the evidence that we know the individual animal and, this, and the particular circumstances. I think as a profession we need to recognise how difficult it is for our colleagues and that we have a long way to go in terms of how we educate owners and help them through to the decisions we believe are the best for the animal's welfare. Thank you all um, very much. Thank you all for your, your questions, your contributions, your uh, comments. Um, you've all kept magnificently to, to time. We're all going to get uh, off to uh, the evening venue for those of you who are going or off to your trains for those of you who are rushing for a train. So um, we've got one more um, closing uh, address to come. But for now, thank you to our panel, Sarah Freeman, Gemma Pearson, Bruce Bladen, Anthony Clements. Thank you all very much. And it only remains for me to invite uh, Julian Kupfer back up to the stage for his closing remarks. <laughs>